Okay, the purpose of this video is to talk about income. So whether you're applying for a loan modification, a repayment plan, a short sale, a deed in lieu, or some sort of other workout option with your bank, um, almost 100% of the time they're going to request what the banks call verification of income. Um, that sounds straightforward, right? But there are a lot of different ways that people receive income. And so my job is to make sure that you guys understand what the bank is looking for, how to present it, and kind of how to get your documents in in a way that will not allow your application to get stuck in the document review process. So what I'll say first off is if you're a self-employed person who has a profit and loss, there should be a separate video for you called profit and loss. That's a whole thing. Watch that video that requires some different information. So if you have your own company or if you're an independent contractor or someone who prepares a 1099 and a profit and loss at the end of the year, watch that video. Don't watch this video. Um, there's two other kinds of income that kind of require more explanation that I put in separate videos. So if you are currently receiving unemployment income or if you have a household contributor, meaning you have someone living in your house that gives you money as part of the household, uh, not a renter, but just like a person in the house, watch a different uh, video. Other than that, we're just gonna walk through kind of the main standard ways that people receive money every month and let you guys know what the bank is looking for. So number one, the bank requests pay stubs. What the bank is looking for to kind of complete these loss mitigation requests is 30 days usually of your most recent pay stubs. Now that sounds easy, but you do have to kind of make sure you understand what your pay period is um, and make sure you provide enough stubs. So people are paid in all different ways. Understand whether you're paid weekly, um, bi-monthly, monthly, and then make sure you're covering a full 30 days. Some pay stubs I see run every 13 or 14 days, so it's a little bit difficult to hit 30 days right on the head. Um, if that's the case and you have one of these 13-day pay stub periods, make sure that you over-provide and you provide more than, the 13, uh, more than the 30 days so that a full 30 days is covered. Um, you're gonna wanna glance at your pay stub before you send it in to make sure that it has all of the information the bank will want. A lot of times pay stubs are issued kind of on two different pages. So you'll have the first page that'll have your name, your year to date, maybe your hire date will be on there and the company's name. And then the next page of your pay stub will have the actual stub. Some people think that all they need to do is just send the stub that shows the payment, but the bank needs to be able to connect your pay stub to you. So before you send your pay stubs in, look at your pay stubs, make sure that it has your name on it, make sure that the bank will understand that it's you who's being paid this money and that you didn't accidentally eliminate information about your company or your employer. Um, and it is, it is good for uh, the pay stub to show your year-to-date payment. Um, what's important to understand with pay stubs is if there's anything weird going on on your pay stubs that does not reflect your normal income, you need to explain that to the bank. And it'd be great if you could explain that right off the bat. Weird things include things like a commission, a bonus, vacation time, or some sort of um, lowering of the income, like maybe you didn't work a certain number of days like you normally do. But basically, you have to take your submission of your pay stubs one step further and make sure that you're giving the bank an accurate representation of what you earn. Um, a big mistake people can make is, you know, they submit a pay stub for a 30-day period that has a one-time bonus or a one-time commission that they received. The bank will look at that one 30-day period and then they'll think that you earn maybe three times as much as you earn. That can cause the bank to ask for a down payment that could cause the bank to think you can afford a high payment and it's just overall not an accurate representation of your income. It's okay if you have those things showing on your statements, but you do need to explain to the bank, hey, this is what I have going on. This is uh, an inconsistent one-time thing. This is not a reflection of my current income. If you have a situation where you have something weird showing up like that or something unusual, then it sh you should send another pay stub from either the prior month or the next Next month or whatever you've got going on to show them what does reflect your normal income so once again if you pull your most recent 30 days pay stub and you look at it and you go this is either way under what I actually make every month or this is way higher than what I make every month make sure you attach a letter of explanation there should be a link connecting you to some example language you can use but attach a letter of explanation to explain to the bank this is why this does not reflect what I normally make and then if you can attach another stub and point them and say this is what I actually make so that you don't kind of mess up your review or end up either denied 
or approved for something that you can't afford. So that's pay stubs. Next type of common income we see is people receiving SSI, uh, social security income. Um, the, what the bank will require is your yearly annual statement. So everybody should receive a letter from the Social Security Administration at the beginning of the year saying this is your monthly total amount that you will receive moving forward for the year of X, whatever year you're in. We're in 2020 right now. Um, some people hold on to copies of this. If you don't have a copy, you can request a copy of this information. This It's called a benefit award letter. You can request a copy of that online. There should be a link below this video helping you request that online. So if you are about to apply for a loss mitigation option and you know you have SSI income and you did not keep that paper that they give you at the beginning of the year, make sure you go through the online process and request another copy of that. Um, before you send in your application so you don't get kind of stuck in this document review process. Um, another common kind of income is pension income or retirement income. Um, if you are somebody who worked for a long period of time and you receive disbursements every month from a pension or retirement fund, the bank is going to want to see two things to verify this income. They're going to want to see receipt of payment. So that should be showing on a bank statement. Typically the way pension income comes to you is it gets automatically deposited every month. Um, so you'll wanna pull the bank, sta bank statements you're sending and make sure they show those deposits. Um, if, if they do not show on the bank statement deposits, then you absolutely need to have a retirement or pension statement. Um, you wanna have both of these. So the number one best way to do it is to send your retirement pension statement, meaning go into your retirement account either online or speak to your broker who helps kind of facilitate your retirement account and see if they can provide you a monthly statement. Most monthly disbursements for pensions and retirement accounts should be able to give you a monthly statement. If you're not somebody who receives them monthly because the deposits just come into your account, then you're gonna to wanna to find the person who, or the company who handles your disbursements and ask them for a monthly statement. Another kind of common type of income is a VA income. Um, if you're a veteran, you receive some sort of monthly income usually. Um, this is similar to pension income in that you should be able to show this deposit going into your bank account every month and the VA should be able to give you a letter with the VA letterhead at the top saying this is how much money this person receives every month. So if you don't have your letter, uh, make sure that you reach out to your VA rep um, and see if you can get a copy of your letter. And then again, you should check your bank statements to make sure it's showing on your bank statements. Um, disability income, similar to above, you should have an award letter telling you either for a certain amount of time, like six months to a year, what your disbursement is. Disability payments don't necessarily come monthly. Sometimes they come every three months or twice a year or once a year. So you do wanna make sure you understand when your payment comes, how often it comes, you wanna get a letter from the uh, company or the agency that disperses these payments to you, and then you wanna make clear to the bank how much you're getting and when. So for example, if you receive a year long's worth of disability payments all at once, you should report that as income on your loss mitigation application. But what you'll do is you'll take a monthly average because as you can see, Many of the lenders want to know what your monthly income is. And so you take that full 12 months that you received and you divide it by 12 and you get your monthly amount. So sometimes you have to do a little bit more work if you're not just receiving a regular monthly amount. Disability payments are kind of one of the ways that you have to think a little bit further. So if you received like $12,000 at the beginning of the year for a year's worth of disability payments, you should be reporting $1,000 a month on your application. You should send in that disability documentation and explain to the bank I received one payment but this is how it breaks down monthly. Um, LNI income. LNI income is interesting right because in Washington State so again I'm a Washington State attorney so this is applying to Washington in Washington State you can be receiving LNI payments before your LNI claim is decided at times and so you want to make sure that you understand whether you have a decided LNI claim or an undecided LNI claim and then you should be able to receive a ledger from LNI showing you what your monthly payment amounts are. Um, I have a little bit more to say about um, 
how to disclose your income to the banks and so you might want to watch that video if you are somebody who's receiving LNI but um, LNI is is viewed sometimes by some investors as not a consistent form of income if your LNI claim hasn't been decided yet and so you do kind of want to make sure you're understanding how that's happening if you are receiving money from LNI in any way you do need to report that um, but you might want to watch a later video I'm gonna make just kind of explaining LNI further and how to best reflect that on your application but for purposes of this video, the documentation for LNI comes from the Department of Labor and Industries. It will tell you how much you're receiving, what the frequency is, and if they're deducting anything for any other purposes, you should have a monthly amount that you can provide. People receive child support income. So if you are somebody who receives child support, you should have a, it's called a child support decree, a court order, uh, signed in some way saying this is what you receive every month. Um, typically these are also deposited directly into the bank account. So you want to check your bank account, see if you have this deposit. Um, if you do not have a copy of your court order decree, you can call the county clerk's office where you went through your um, family law matter and they should be able to re-provide you um, a copy of the documentation showing that you do legally receive that child support every month. So you definitely want to make sure you count that. Um, and then we have uh, an interesting type of income verification. So because we're such a cool, technologically advanced community now, and there's so many different opportunities for people to work, I'm seeing all of these um, deposits on bank statements from Zelle, from Venmo, from Uber, from Etsy, um, people selling things online, right? That's income, 100% that is income. And so you should use this income to help get your application through. Some people you make tons of money getting income in this way. But what's important to understand is if you are selling products or doing services, DoorDash is another one that applies, but basically if you're doing something where the company you're working for is depositing random monies into your bank account as you work, your lender, the one that you're applying for a loss mitigation option with, views you as an independent contractor who is self-employed. So even if that's not how you view you, even if that's not how Uber views you, I don't really know much about that, but what I do know is to validate this type of income and to have this type of income counted, you want to present a profit and loss statement, which as I said at the beginning of this video, there is a separate video on how to write your profit and loss income. I'm gonna go through these types of deposits and just make sure you guys know the best way to present your income. But basically, those types of deposits are 100% income, but a lot of times they get lost in loss mitigation applications because if it's not W-2 income, it's kind of hard to provide proof of that. And so you need to explain to the bank with a letter and with a profit and loss statement that this is the job I'm doing, this is what I'm bringing in, and you need to connect that with the deposits showing on your bank statements. So in that profit and loss video, I will, um, go through that in more detail. And then lastly, just a little catch-all here. Um, it's impossible for me to sit here and go through every last iota of income I've ever seen, but people make money in a ton of different ways. If you're somebody who is doing side jobs for cash or something um, that I haven't covered here and you want to use that income in your application, you have to do two main things. Number one, make sure you start depositing the money into your bank account. A lot of people receive cash for a service and then they just kind of spend the cash or they save it, but they don't ever deposit it. If you're going to tell the bank this is income I'm receiving, the bank is going to want to make sure that they can see this income and that it's traceable in order to count it. And so creating a, a trace of this income in your bank statements will allow you to explain and connect to the bank. So if you're receiving cash deposits or doing some sort of work, babysitting is one I see a lot, childcare, things like that. If you're doing any of that, you should be able to count that as income. And if that's regular money that your household really does rely on, you do want that to count. So you have to deposit it into your bank account and then you have to explain to the bank via a letter of explanation, this is how I earn money. And then you're gonna have to point them to the deposits on the bank statements. So I do have some links to some sample letters to help you with that language. But if you are someone who receives income in a way I did not mention, and again, profit loss, uh, household contributors and unemployment income will be separate videos. But if you are someone who's kind of just working and getting cash, that's income. And you need to know how to present that to the bank. So make sure you're depositing that money in your bank accounts. You might be submitting a profit and loss statement for it. So watch the profit and loss video. But minimum, you should be writing a letter and telling them this is how I earn money. And then being able to show the bank this is how I receive it. Thanks, guys.